All right, a video that I really don't want to make. I'm not going to have very much fun making this video. You guys are probably not going to have very much fun watching it, but I think it's a video that needs to be done nonetheless. And I'm not just going to be regurgitating the news to you that you can go out there and read for yourself. I have my own perspective on this that I think is a little bit unique. And I think that it's something that I needed to put into words. Uh, there was a shooting that occurred in Sandy Hook. And we're not going to talk about that particular incident anymore because I think that to do so, adds fame and infamy to the perpetrator of that act and that's just not something that I'm cool with and I also have very strong opinions about the political machine that has taken advantage of the victims of that tragedy for political gain and I don't think that going any deeper into that discussion is something that would fly on a censorship laden platform like YouTube. What we're talking about is Remington, and they've been basically the subject of a storm of litigation since the incident occurred. For the most part, none of the lawsuits have stuck save one. That particular lawsuit in April of 2016 is when it was heard, implicated Remington, the distributor, and the retail shop that was responsible for transferring the firearm in question in a lawsuit. But ultimately, that one was dismissed under the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act. And we're going to refer to that as POLCA. And that is actually the centerpiece of what we're talking about here today is that piece of legislation. The common sense concept of weapons are dangerous. When we want to employ a weapon in a particular scenario, we want the most effective weapon that we can employ. In order to do that, we need dangerous weapons. This is vital in the United States, whether you're a gun owner or not, okay? That is irrelevant. If you live in the United States, if you're an American, you're protected overseas by dudes wearing green, sometimes tan, with guns. And those guns are purchased by your government and handed to those young men to do their duty. That is purchased with your tax dollars. And a provision like Polka is there to ensure that the underpinning of that market, the military industrial complex remains so that the U United States government can get the testing that they want to have done, have the product development done that they want to have done, and ultimately get the next generation to keep ahead of the United States competitors. If you start damaging the commercial market by disrupting day-to-day -day business activities through frivolous lawsuits on the basis that firearms are dangerous, then you ultimately will damage the ability of the United States to defend itself. So real quick, if you found yourself onto this video uh, and you're not a gun person, this next part is specifically for you or somebody who doesn't have a really solid understanding of how uh, development of weaponry for the United States military occurs or how procurement works or anything like that. Basically, it's all done by the commercial market. Everybody talks about these big government contracts and things like that. They're good for the long-term uh, solvency of your business in that those contracts keep you working, but they are lowest bidder type stuff. Is anybody under the illusion that the United States military pays $8,500 for an M249? Uh, that is the going rate for the M249S from FN, the uh, civilian version, the semi-automatic version of their squad automatic weapon. Uh, they aren't paying that much for that thing. They're paying lowest bidder prices, and I would say that it's probably somewhere around four to six thousand instead of eighty five hundred. They subsidize those contracts with commercial results, but all of the research and development money, all of the uh, innovation to the next generation of stuff happens because of the commercial boost. It has very little to do with the direct monetary compensation that a particular contractor gets from the government for producing their goods. In fact, the majority of the procurement goes kind of like this. The commercial market is using this thing and somebody who's in a procurement position looks at that thing and they say, wow, that thing's neat. Why don't you send us a few of them? We'll beat them around and see if it's something we can use or if something that we can tweak slightly. Process two, and this is much more rare, they say, hey, we need this particular thing. And they basically submit the procurement request. It has all the criteria, like the uh, modular handgun system that, they, that the Army recently did. 
And basically all those companies go out and they either create something from scratch or they take what they've got and slap whatever new stuff the government wants on it and submit it for testing. And then whoever wins, wins. A lot of times those are geared towards a particular product anyway that's already in existence, but I digress. That is how arms manufacture for government ends happens. If you are an American, you are protected by that. You have a vested interest whether you like guns on the streets or not. So I apologize, I digress there for a minute. I get a little bit heated when uh, ignorance of something drives opinions. And I think that if everybody had a solid grasp of uh, the world around them, that perhaps some of the more asinine opinions that we have would fall by the wayside. But uh, sorry, I, I apologize. Continuing, the lawsuit was ultimately dismissed citing Polka. I would say correctly dismissed citing Polka, but it was then resurrected when it was appealed to the state Supreme Court. And in March of this year, they said that they can indeed be sued because there's a state regulation in the state of Connecticut called the Connecticut Unfair Trade Practices Act. And they said that they could be sued citing uh, wrongful marketing. So that was at the Connecticut State Supreme Court. Remington then appeals to the United States Supreme Court and asks them the simple question of, can an arms manufacturer be held liable for misuse of their product? So fast forward to today, and the United States Supreme Court decided not to hear the case. And that's it. They didn't say anything else. So everything that you've heard assigned to the Supreme Court Remember, they did not say that. All they said is, we don't want to hear the case. But what that actually means is that they agree with where it's at, at the lower court, at the state Supreme Court. They agree with that it's all right there, that it does not violate federal law. Remember that states are sovereign as long as they don't have a conflict between federal and state law. And that the state of Connecticut clearly has a beef with you in the form of negligence. That needs to play out. And this is really just not our purview. So this means that the lower court's decision stands to allow the lawsuit against Remington on the grounds that they target a disturbed use in their marketing campaigns. That's where we currently stand. So from this, I think that we can gain some insight in the direction that this is going and also how the whole thing with Remington is probably going to conclude. And to do that, I want to read a direct quote from the attorney of the plaintiff. Remington used militaristic marketing and astute product placement in violent first-person shooter video games. So that has some pretty interesting implications if you think about it for a second. The premise is that the mass shooting occurred because Remington inserted their product into a violent video game that was then consumed by an at-risk youth that then went on to perpetrate a violent crime, misusing the product, and in that whole process, Remington is negligent because they targeted troubled youth. Guys, that's a stretch if I have ever heard one, but for the sake of argument, we'll just go ahead and accept it. And to do the proof, we would then have to ask the next question, which is, has Remington ever paid for placement in a video game before? I find that highly unlikely, having been around the industry for a little while and kind of understanding how what I'm going to call dinosaur companies operate, uh, I think it's highly unlikely that they would spend money to be in something as edgy as a video game placement. So I said, you know, maybe I'm a little bit off. So I went ahead and contacted some of my people that actually work in that space. And all I did was screenshot the statement and send it to them by a text message. And all I got was laughs. And they said, one, that has never happened. Remington has never done that. If it did happen, we would know about it, and we certainly didn't do it. <laughs> Attorneys are never done. They love to hear themselves talk, but I want to get this right. He says that it was always been the goal to shed light on Remington's calculated and profit-driven strategy to expand the AR-15 market and court high-risk users, all at the expense of American safety. My God, that assertion is absurd. So this dude <laughs> is under the illusion that Remington is responsible for the mass expansion and popularity of the AR-15 style rifle. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Who buys Remington products anyway? This dude is completely off of his rocker. So what I would think 
actually, is a more likely scenario that uh, some of these rifles, like the Bushmaster ACR and things like that, are showing up in video games is that the video game put them into their programming without the consent of the manufacturer. So, quick caveat, gaming, if you are a gamer or you run a gaming channel or you subscribe to a gaming channel, send this to your gaming channels. Uh, they should be aware of this because I think that we can clearly see where the target's being drawn next. Uh, they're coming for you, and it would not surprise me at all if the way that those games are regulated uh, doesn't change in relative short order. I think that we can see that... It's low-hanging fruit. In fact, I was at the bar the other day eating lunch, and some dude was sitting there talking about how it was all video games' fault and stuff like that. And I just simply asked him the question, how many hours have you logged in something like Call of Duty or anything like that? And he's like, me? None. I've never played anything like that. Generally speaking, when something is not well understood, it becomes a really easy scapegoat for people that just don't understand it or don't want to understand it or have an agenda that they want to push away from themselves and that is um, unfortunately headed that way i like gaming i find it a good way to kind of relax my brain at the end of the day because it's constantly moving i use it as a sleep aid rather than going to like ambient or anything like that i just play an hour of video games and i'm ready to go to bed video game people this may fall on deaf ears uh they're coming for you next fair warning i think it's pretty clear to see that that's the direction they're headed second amendment gun ownership right to bear arms constitutionally protected right. A lot more difficult to take down something like that than something that's a privilege, a luxury item like video games. That Some of you guys may even have it as your livelihood. I'm just telling you. Uh, join with us now when you got the opportunity. We're a lot stronger together. Uh, I'll say no more on the topic. So I know that we've come to a fairly pessimistic view at this point of the whole situation, but guys, I do want to state, just because you get sued doesn't mean that you automatically lose. And just because you sue somebody doesn't mean that you automatically win. All those assertions have to be tested. So the violent video games thing has to be tested. We have to also prove that Remington paid for the advertisement. Probably not gonna find that. Just gonna say that that probably didn't happen. We also have to test the assertion that Remington is responsible for the growth of the AR-15 platform, which is clearly absurd. Uh, that did not happen. All of the companies that make AR-15s, there is not a single Remington product in this room, and there are a lot of AR-15s in this room. Just throwing that out there. You can sue anybody for anything these days. That doesn't mean that you're going to get away with it. But I think what is important that we recognize is that this isn't about Remington. Nobody cares about Remington. How many bankruptcies are they going to declare because their products suck? That's not it. Nobody cares about Remington. What we do care about is that this is a case study on how they're going to dismantle the firearms industry. Because Remington is kind of one of those, eh, nobody cares products. They're a prime candidate for everybody to ignore what's going on with them because nobody buys their stuff. Also, they're in a blue state. The deck is stacked against them in that state. What they're trying to do is establish a precedent by which they can just a million cuts, millions of dollars spent on these lawsuits over the time. Even if they end up winning them, it still costs them up front the capital to be able to litigate these. Bottom line is that Remington's a big guy. Some of those smaller guys aren't going to have the cash to be able to handle that kind of litigation over time. And it's just going to result in an overall contraction in the industry. So how does this affect you as a consumer other than the generalized contraction of the industry resulting in fewer choices and higher prices? Well, to speak anecdotally for a second, I actually hold an 07 FFL. That's the manufacturer's license uh, with the SOT, which is the Specul Special Occupation Tax Stamp Edition, uh, so that can work in various areas of the firearms industry. And I hold that license for R&D purposes. I work as an independent contractor with companies across the breadth of the industry to help them bring their best, most robust version of their product to market. And I think that that's a vital function. I'm sure that some of you will agree with me, but the insurance agencies that uh, write, uh, that underwrite the liability insurance policies 
four of these companies that manufacture firearms think that that's important because they give you a break on your yearly premium for engaging in third-party testing with companies like mine. But I also have to hold such a liability insurance policy. And the only way that somebody who engages in the manufacture of arms in the United States can be sued under Polka is if they are negligent. Well, what this case does is set a dangerous precedent where now instead of having a narrow scope of negligence by which a company can be sued, now we've started to expand and added smaller subcategories and we've expanded the base by which a company can be considered negligent. Well, when you are a underwriter and you are looking at the risk exposure of your company for insuring somebody, that sort of thing has to be taken into account. Currently, it's a very small percentage of claims that actually make it through that they have to take care of because their exposure is so small because firearms industry is pretty much by the book. We cross all our I's and dot all our T's and for the most part, we don't usually get sued. And because of that, our premiums tend to stay pretty low. I can admit that my insurance uh, premium is pretty affordable, even for a small guy like me. So what that means, although it scales uh, to the size of the business, that as you open up those categories even more, those premiums have to cover a broader base of risk and therefore that premium is going to rise over time and ultimately that's going to result in more expensive products for you, the consumer. So that's really it guys. There's two things you gotta keep your eyes on, the short term and the long term. Long term, they're trying to build a playbook to dismantle the firearms industry at the manufacturer level, going after the pocketbook. <clears throat> they can't get it done at the legislative, both state and federal legislative levels. So they're going after below the belt, trying to basically put companies out of business through bankruptcies and things like that to ultimately knock out enough of them so that the guns become too expensive, parts become unobtainium, the whole military industrial con complex contracts, and therefore you have to pay more for the stuff that you want. Ultimately, boxing out first people of lower income and then moving up the chain. Short term, I expect that once the repercussions of the lawsuit with Remington are felt that those insurance providers are going to increase those premiums. And ultimately that is going to result in a little bit of a bump in prices. I expect you guys to see that um, coming in the next couple of years, whenever that whole thing comes down the line, should that case go the wrong way for Remington. Again, guys, I am fairly optimistic about the odds on that one because I think there's a lot for them to prove, but it is in a blue state. So keep your chin up. Thank you guys for joining us here today on the VSO Gun Channel. I did not have fun making this video at all, and I do apologize if I seem just a little bit off. I spent the first part of the day in the ER uh, with my wife. She was sick today. So uh, guys, try to give me a break, at least if I screwed something up. Uh, again, thanks for watching and hopefully we'll see you guys on a future video on a little bit more lighthearted topic.